stand up and sing our last song. I think by now probably a lot of you have looked at the sermon outline and have noticed that I'm preaching on marriage this morning. I know that marriage can be very frequently difficult for many people in our world. Most begin as too young and profoundly self-centered, <laughs> sinful individuals who have to learn to put up with each other's issues and idiosyncrasies and have to learn to function together as a team to raise children, to be part of a church, and to just grow in our lives. A few years ago, I read a short anecdote for you, and and I want to start out that way again this morning. I read of A couple who were having a 60th anniversary party, and it was thrown by their children. But during the time, the the husband was very moved. He wanted to stand up and say something just profound about his wife of 60 years. And the issue that they were having at 60 years of marriage is she 
had begun to get pretty hard of hearing, so she didn't always understand everything. But in the midst of the celebration, the husband stood up and he said, My dear wife, after 60 years, I have found you tried and true. Everyone clapped and were excited about this just great statement about this woman. But the woman was clearly a little bit irritated. And so she asked him to repeat. And he said once again, after 60 years, I have found you tried and true. Now visibly upset, she said, you know, after 60 years, I'm tired of you too. (laughs) Thought that one was uh, worth saying again. I also read that it was George Burns who said, I was married by a judge, but I should have asked for a jury. (laughs) Rodney Dangerfield, this is terrible, I'm reading these quotes before Scripture, but we're going to get there. Rodney Dangerfield, who gets no respect, says this, my wife and I were happy for 20 years, and then we met. (laughs) Wow, we better move on here. As I think about marriage, I make some jokes at the beginning, but marriage in our country, in our world, and even within the church is in grave, grave danger. 40% of first-time marriages end in divorce, and it is even higher statistic for those who have been married already more than once. We have a situation on our hands, and as I said, it's not just in the world, but it's in our churches as well. And so today we come to a passage in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 which deals with the subject of marriage. Peter in this book has already addressed the the foundation and the importance, first of all, of salvation. And then he talks about holiness and he talks about Christian conduct again and again and again. And now he moves sort of, excuse me, seemingly out of the blue to the marriage relationship. But I want you to know this morning that this does not come entirely out of the blue. I want to give you the reminder that that once again, Peter is writing to real people. He's writing to real people who make up the churches all throughout Asia. These are real people who are trying to live out their faith in a hostile culture. He's writing to real people who have real struggles in life and also in their marriages. Peter wasn't writing this in a vacuum. He is writing this because there was something going on in that time in those churches with marriages. And so, in the same way as we read these words almost 2,000 years later, there's some principles that we can take from each and every one of these verses. Um, And I want to say this as a disclaimer. Peter is writing to people, obviously, who are married. But I want to say this for you, the congregation, whether you've been married for 60 years and it's been just 60 years of bliss, or whether you've been married a short period of time, or maybe you are single, or maybe you're divorced, or maybe you're just a high schooler or younger, I want you to know that there are principles that you can take from these verses. And maybe you stand back and say, Well, that's kind of a stretch, but the answer is no, it's not, because even within these verses, we find important reminders of of what a godly mate should look like. So if you are a high school girl, looking at my daughter, of course, or if you're a a college student and you're out there and and you're starting to think, okay, what do I want to see in my future mate? I want to give you the reminder that Like right here, there are such good, important descriptions of what a godly husband should look like and also what a godly wife should look like. And further, just to elaborate on this, I frequently think of those who end up settling. 
those who know better, those fine Christian young men or young women who somehow over time begin to lower their standards and they end up marrying someone that they ought not to marry. And so then they feel stuck in a relationship where it's a real struggle. And maybe they're excited about spiritual things and want to come to church, but maybe their spouse is disinterested in spiritual things. Maybe they're just entirely disobedient to God and say, you know, Christianity is your thing, but not mine. And they stay back or stay home, or maybe they dart through the doors and then dart out once again. I want you to know that the principles are there for all of us this morning. And I'd like you to turn with me to the book of 1 Peter if you're not already there. And I want to read the first seven verses of chapter 3. And even before I read, I want to say this. You are going to see the word submission right out of the gate. And I know this for a fact because I've done enough premarital counseling where we look at this passage and also Ephesians 5 and we see these words and I'll tell you what even the most mild-mannered God-fearing Christ-loving Christian young women often start to get a little unsettled when they see the word submission so this morning I'm, I'm going to address it I want to talk about what it means and what it looks like and I'm not going to try to skirt around the issue we need to hit it head on we need to address it because it is a scriptural command so let's look at at what it means and we will talk about that so please just as we hit the <laughs> one two three as we hit the fourth word don't tune out the rest of scripture this morning starting in verse one of first peter chapter three <coughs> excuse me he begins by addressing the wives and he says, wives likewise, by the way, that word likewise takes us back to the previous chapter where he talks about different submission to the government authorities, submission to masters, and it continues on this same theme. So wives likewise, be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, okay, right here we're talking about unbelieving Husbands. We're talking about husbands who are not equally yoked with their wives. We're talking about wives who love Jesus and, and husbands who don't really care or who are apathetic at best. So wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the Word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And do not let your adornment be merely outward, the arranging of the hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of fine apparel, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God, by, by the way, take note of this word right here, former times, holy women who did what? Who trusted in God, also adorned themselves, being submissive even to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And then verse 7. Husbands, snap to attention. Husbands, likewise, again, that word likewise takes us back to this whole theme of submitting to any sort of authorities and even the submitting to one another. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, there's a lot of things going on and so I want to begin by 
giving you some preliminary thoughts. Well, well, first of all, our main thought, which is going to be up on the screen, and it's on each one of your sermon outlines as well, just want to give you the reminder that God is always honored, and also God rewards or gives blessings when we conduct ourselves the right way. The reality is as we read through Scripture, and again, as I referenced Ephesians chapter 5 and, and 1 Peter chapter 3, we see that, that God has given us a blueprint for what marriage looks like and how marriage is supposed to play out. And when we are conducting ourselves not according to the world system, with the world around us, what society says, but if we're focusing on God's blueprint, then He provides blessings for us. And there will be blessings untold in our marriages because of our faithfulness to the Lord. So, so there's a main thought for this morning. But let me give you some other preliminary thoughts. First, first of all, I want to remind you also that the context that we're in, again, this is not just, he doesn't just throw marriage out here out of the blue. The context that this is written in is the whole idea of being a witness to the unsaved world. This is what he's talking about, primarily what we see in these verses. And again, while these principles transcend all marriages, what we see here is specifically he's talking about the wives who are to set an example and be a profound spiritual witness to their unsaved husbands. That's the primary thrust of the first six verses and then verse seven then the thrust is for a godly man who's married to a, a woman who has maybe rejected or is hardened to the gospel so our main theme throughout middle of chapter two and onward into chapter three is being a witness to the world around in fact i'd like you to turn back maybe it's a page maybe it's on the same page but chapter two verse twelve because one of the key themes that we see again and again and again in the book of 1 Peter is this whole idea of how we conduct ourselves, how we behave, how we live our lives, and how that acts as a testimony to unbelievers. So in chapter 2, verse 12, he says this, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Again, just to simplify, live your lives in such a way that other people see Christ in you and that they're drawn to the Gospel, that they begin to love Jesus or see Jesus because the way you live your life. And, th and that comes down to what we talked about Two weeks ago, our response to the government. That comes down to what Norby talked about last week as well. And it fits right into the marriage relationship as well. The reality, and Peter's point right here, is that godly conduct is a powerful, powerful witness for Christ. There's a lot of women who sort of ride their husbands by nagging or imploring or pleading or browbeating their husbands to come to church or be involved in spiritual things. And, and, and I've heard of women who constantly tell their husbands, you need to step up and be the leader. And, and that us, like in one sense, it, it kind of cracks me up because really you're going to tell me to be the leader that I should be, so you, you're ordering me to do it. So on one hand, it kind of cracks me up, but on the other hand, it, it's kind of sad that men don't step up in our world, in our churches, and be the leader that Christ has ordained us to be. And so what, what we need to see and what Peter's saying right here is, he's saying, hey women, hey wives, instead of nagging, instead of browbeating, instead of pressuring your husbands, be a witness. Be a witness through your actions and through your behavior that might ultimately draw him to Christ. Second thing I want to point out, and this is you probably already filled in the blanks on this one, but the word submission. It's not a dirty word. Right out of the gate we see that this is a potentially explosive 
word that many women object to, but submission is not a dirty word. So let me look very briefly at this concept. It's going to come up again a few points later, but we need to see that, that perhaps put most simply, and again, there's all sorts of different ways to look at this. Usually what we begin doing, and I don't know if this is out of cowardice or what, but we usually start out by saying, well, here are the 10 things that submission is not before I tell you the one thing that it is. But just let me give you the, the simple definition first. Simply put, submission is putting someone else first. Okay, that's what it means right there. Here, wives are called to submit to their unbelieving husbands. These wives in this context are to say, you know what, I am going to submit my will to yours. And and literally, it it means to place yourself under the authority of someone else. It's actually a military term. Placing yourself voluntarily under the leadership of, of someone else it's saying i am willing and ready to follow your lead and of course jesus christ is the per- is the perfect example of all of this jesus came to this earth and he submitted himself to the father's will that he might live out and do what god wanted him to do furthermore as i've already referenced twice but um, probably <clears throat> Excuse me. Probably the most instructive passages in all of Scripture on marriage is Ephesians 5, where the Apostle Paul tells us that, that, that God has ordained the husband and the wife as a team to impact eternity. And the husband is to have a leadership role and he's to lead his wife in godliness. He's to be the the wife's lover and leader. He is to love her as much as Christ loved the church. And I do want to say this really on the front side because this is so important to grasp. If there's anyone out there right now who's sort of bristling with this idea, I would hope that you just kind of take a step back Give it a rest for a minute because I want you to picture the godly relationship. And as the husband, if the husband, and I'm talking about two people who love the Lord right now. We'll address the other one later. Two people come together. They love Jesus. And if the husband is following his requirements in verse 7 or also in Ephesians chapter 5, if the husband is, is loving and caring and understanding and showing love and respect and honor to his wife, it should be very easy then for the wife to stand back and say, you know what? I see that you love me and care about me, that you're sensitive to my needs, and I should have no problem in saying, I will follow your lead because you have already demonstrated the humility. We read in in Philippians chapter 2, also just how we are to put one another first if the husband is doing that and then the wife can come along and say i see that you're already being sacrificial and so sometimes we hold this word submission up as this dirty harsh word and frankly it's not it's a good word and and the wife should find tremendous freedom in the ability to just bask under the leadership of her husband so What makes this passage so fascinating to me is that the wife here is married to someone who's not a believer, and yet Peter still tells her to be submissive. So what does that look like, and why would he say it? Well, obviously he says it so that through her behavior, because really, really the, the other option is she can fight him on everything. It can, she can be obstinate. She can say, I have freedom in Christ, and therefore you need to do this, and you better do that. And, and she can be, frankly, quite terrible to him. And Peter is saying, just submit, and slowly but surely, maybe he's going to come to Christ. want to move on here. We'll, we'll hit submission again in five minutes from now, maybe ten um, I, I want to remind you that, that the issue with submission and the issue with, with gender roles in marriage, it, it all goes back to the book of Genesis 
right after the fall. So Genesis 1 and 2, everything was absolutely perfect on the earth. Adam and Eve lived in fellowship, in harmony with one another. They walked with God. They had great fellowship with Him. But then sin entered the world in Genesis chapter 3. And as a result of sin entering the world, suddenly there is disorder in the marriage relationship. And what is fascinating to me, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 God pronounces the curse on the woman right here. And here's what he says to her. He says, well, to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. I know you women are really thankful for that, aren't you? Greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. And then it says this, and your desire will be for your husband and He will rule over you. I want to tell you this, that in the Hebrew, where it says your desire will be for your husband is best translated as you will desire the power or the leadership that He has been granted by God. You, you will chafe under His leadership and you will want to control your husband i'm telling you it all goes back to genesis 3 and the curse and and i'm telling you that is the best translation it's the best way to look at that verse and and i could take you to the hebrew and show you that but really not not that fun because hebrew is a very difficult difficult language but we see that sin resulted in the woman seeking to usurp the leadership of the man and then also part of this curse we see that man became passive and sort of namby pamby and so it was very easy for women to step up and say you know what he's not leading he's not doing what he should somebody's got to take the lead so i am going to do it so it all goes back to the beginning right here and don't hate me for saying this just understand this is what Scripture has to say. And so, th- th- then here's the beautiful part. And I want you to see this because then Christ. Okay? Y- you've got things messed up since the beginning when sin entered the world in Genesis 3. But then Christ came as the restorer to the marriage relationship. Christ came to restore. Christ came to set things right. Christ came to mend what was broken and reverse the curse. And so what we see is the the benefit or the blessing that Jesus Christ brings. He brings something to change and to restore man and to say, okay, men, husbands, it's time for you to step up and begin to lead and begin to love your wives just as much as I love the church. And so that's Christ's call. He comes to restore. So instead of the husband being lethargic while Satan leads the wife into sin, instead of that, the husband is active. He is active in living for his wife and giving his life for his wife. He is active in serving her and washing her with the water of the Word. All of this is in Ephesians chapter 5. We see the husband takes on the role of leading her into holiness and godliness. Finally, because of Christ, the man can begin once again to do what he was supposed to do. Where Adam failed, Christ succeeds. He shows us what biblical manhood is and He dies for His bride, the church, and He purifies her through the Word. So I want to remind you, Christ came to fix broken people and broken relationships and broken marriages. And He does that to bring us back to how it's supposed to be. So if you're sitting out here this morning and you think, you know what? My marriage is so far broke, we can never recover from this. We're, we're ships passing in the night, and, and I don't think that, that anything can repair our broken relationship. I want to promise you right now, 
Jesus Christ can do it. And we see this all throughout the verses that, that we haven't hardly touched on yet, but in verses 1-7, through seven, we see how your testimony can be a light to your spouse. We see that Christ can restore any relationship. He delights in fixing what is broken, but He only does that as we submit our lives to Him and to His Word. Let's move on and let's talk about some lessons that we see in the Scripture. I'm not going to dwell on point one for very long because we've just talked about this, but we see right away in verse one this call to submission. I want to remind you also that even as we talk about this, husbands, wives, men, and women, <coughs> we are 100% equal with one another. When the Scripture asks the wives to submit, the Scripture is not saying women are less valuable than men. It's not saying women are worthless leaders. It's not saying that women are inferior at all. Men and women completely 100% equal in Christ, but the husband has been given by God. This is a God-given responsibility. And I want you to, I use this word carefully, God-given responsibility, not privilege, like, oh, I'm a privileged leader, so you better submit to me. God-given responsibility to lead my household. That is what God has given to me. That's what God has given to you husbands who are out there. And you young men who are unmarried yet, I want you to know right now, God has given you the responsibility to lead and guide and direct your family, to nourish them in God's Word, to draw your kids to Christ, to shepherd your wife, to love and attend and care for her. God-given responsibility. This means... Again, not a privilege. This means that someday I have to stand in front of the Lord and give an account of my family. Hey, did, uh, did your wife walk with the Lord? Did she follow after me? Did she do what she should be doing? Did she grow in a relationship with Christ? Okay, this might seem totally profound to all of you, but so much of that comes back to the leadership of the husband. And someday I have to answer to Christ for the way that I led my family family for the way I shepherded my wife. And if I am cold and domineering and insensitive and uncaring, I have to answer to Christ for that. But I want you to know that I'm here today to say that men, so are you. You need to understand what Christ is calling you to do. And even if your wife seems to be domineering, even if she seems to be pushy, it's time for you to read the words of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands. And also Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 33. Husbands, read these verses. And wives, read these verses as well. So understand, the role of the wife then is to enjoy the leadership of the husband. Not to try to thwart him. Not to try to usurp any authority. Be the partner in life and in ministry. Um, The reality is this. God has ordained it. We need to listen and we need to do what God has called us to do. If you want to talk about submission, feel free to ask someone else. No, (laughs) I want to move on though. We can talk about that later if you have any questions about what that looks like to me. Let, Let me tell you this just before I move on. I want to say this, that... I've been married for over 20 years right now. I believe I know or understand or I'm at least learning what Christ wants me to do as the leader of my home and leader of my family. Still, it's a work in progress. My lovely wife understands what her role needs to be. She has tremendous freedom in Christ and tremendous freedom in our relationship. And I'll tell you this, I could maybe count on two fingers the time that it's ever 
come down to anything that would resemble even veto power. Here's what we do. Because as I try to put her first, as I try to be sensitive to what God wants me to do, if we have an issue or if we have a situation and we can't figure out what to do, and maybe I want to go a certain way or do a certain thing, and she says, you know, I just I don't feel comfortable with this. Let's tell you, if I'm being the man that I'm supposed to be, if I'm following Christ's orders for me, then I better take time to listen to what she says that, that would just be logical and, and smart of me to do that. And so in, in our 20 plus years of marriage, it doesn't come down to, to me standing back and say, me, man, you submit. It doesn't happen that way. We talk. I care about her. She cares about me. We work things out and, and it's not this domineering thing and she's not a doormat. Obviously, for any of you who know my wife, this is how it works out. It is not like this submission commission that, that men run around and wave our hands and you better listen to me and you're going to do this and you're going to like it even if you don't like it. It doesn't work that way. You see, there's always the two sides. The man's role, responsibility, and also the woman's role, responsibility. And it's about love and care and connection with one another. Second point is this. Godly behavior is to draw other people to Christ. We see this in the first six verses. And then we also see it in verse 7 as well. Godly behavior is can be so powerful that it transforms the husband in those first six verses. Peter is saying that a wife who is submissive doesn't even need words because she lives out the Gospel. She lives it out. She doesn't have to use her words. And so again, Peter's given this scenario of a wife who has probably gotten saved after she has already been married and she's gotten saved and her husband is still an unbeliever back then in the greco-roman times what usually was expected is that the woman would take up the religion of her husband and if she didn't follow him into his religion there was social issues at stake right there and so for these women who have been liberated like hey i found christ and and the husband is standing back and saying Wait a second, you're still supposed to worship all these pagan gods that I worship. So how does a woman function in that? And maybe how do some of you function in a relationship where right now you don't feel equally yoked? And the answer is this. Live submissively with a purpose in mind. And that purpose is that you can draw that husband ultimately to Christ. Peter is saying that essentially the life of submission is God's perfect plan for the wife to be so beautiful and so saturated on the inside with the Gospel that ultimately the husband will be led to Christ. And there I, I could tell you story after story of people who became converted after watching the behavior of their spouse. One story I read this last week is a story uh, of a Hindu woman who was converted, and she was converted by hearing the Word of God from a missionary, and she responded. And immediately in her country, there was persecution all over the place, and some of the harshest persecution came from her husband. And so one day this missionary asked her and said, when your husband is angry and when he persecutes you, what do you do? Here's what this godly woman said. She said, well, I try to cook his food better. And when he complains, I, sleep, I sweep the floor cleaner. And when he speaks unkindly, I answer him mildly. And then she said, I try to show him that when I became a Christian, I became a better wife and a better mother. Some of you sit back and, and you say, really? What about her rights? Shouldn't she stand up for herself? But she said, I spoke back mildly, I cleaned better, and I cooked better. And the end of this story, true story, the consequence was that ultimately, sure the husband could withstand all sorts of nagging and preaching, but when he started to see 
her actions and see how Christ had entirely transformed her. Ultimately, this man gave his life to the Lord. I think this principle applies even for those who are are equally yoked, husbands and wives who are both believers. Sometimes the wife still nags and nags and nags. It's the, the path most traveled in a relationship is, let me tell you what you should do. Peter is saying that is largely ineffective. Instead, that pushes the other person further away. All right, let's start to wrap this up. I spent most of my time in the first half of the sermon. Great surprise, I'm sure. What we see also in this passage in the next several verses is that God calls for the development of inner beauty. He says, don't let your adornment be all this external stuff. Don't make your looks the main issue. Instead of spending three hours in the mirror every morning, Spend some time growing in godliness. Spend some time working on what is most important, which is not externals. Hello, I live with three women and I know how they can dominate the bathroom and I know how at least one of the women in my family changes outfits about three times a day before school. I tipped it off. Before anything begins, I, I see that in our world we are consumed with appearance. And the men too. Sometimes I see how my boys do the same thing. Spend time getting pretty instead of spending time in God's Word. Now that being said, I believe my children have good devotional life too. But I'll tell you what. You see how so much focus and energy in our culture, in our world, and even in the church is on looking good on the outside. God is concerned about inner beauty work on that because i'll tell you what again as husbands see the inner beauty as they see that christ has changed you on the inside that will draw them closer to him wrapping up verse seven this is our fourth point right here as well just skip over a couple of pages of notes here we need to understand that god has called husbands, I'm switching gears to the husbands, God has called husbands to be sensitive and caring with their spouses. Let me read verse 7 once again. Husbands likewise dwell with them in understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Some of the things we see right here, uh, dwell with them in understanding. This means you need to know your spouse. To know your spouse, you spend time. You're not working 24 hours a day. You're not doing your your hobbies and off running around while she's left at home holding the bag. You spend time. You dwell with her in understanding. We see also that, that the husband, the true godly genuine believer husband is to honor his wife to care so much about her that that he builds her up that he respects her to this um, significant degree and, and that he talks her up even to his friends who are around we need to be sure that we as husbands are doing that for our wives being sensitive to her concerns and cares and involvements and needs Honor her as a precious treasure. And then finally, and some people say, well, what in the world does this mean? Where, where it says, um, it says, bring honor to your wife as to the weaker vessel. Some people, what is this weaker vessel thing? I think it could be two things. Number one, the husband is called on to be the protector of his wife. We, men, call to be protectors. That is a God-given thing probably within all of us be the protector but i think a second and maybe a more profound application or implication is this as the woman as the wife chooses to obey god in submission she puts herself out there right okay this is a hard thing for 
anyone to do. It's a hard thing for women to put themselves out there and say, you know what? You've been an ungodly husband, but I'm going to submit myself to you. She's putting herself out there and showing a sign of weakness. How then should the husband respond to that? Well, she's already saying, hey, I'm offering myself up and offering myself out there. He better take that into account and appreciate that and deal with her as someone who has put herself out there. Finally, quick conclusions right here. Successful marriages. If you want to have a God-honoring marriage, if you want to think about what you need to do, again, whether you've been married for a week, whether you're going to get married, whether you've been married for 60 plus years, understand this. Successful marriages take work from both parties. Both parties are involved. Not a one-way street. Yes, this passage here, we see very clearly what the woman needs to do if the man is unsaved. We see what the man is supposed to do if the wife is unsaved. But I'll tell you this, for all of us, takes work on both parts to be fully successful and God-honoring. Second thing, successful marriages involve selflessness. You put the other first, not putting yourself first. Successful marriages are a team. When you get married, you become one flesh emotionally, physically, spiritually, and you become a team for impacting the rest of the world. Your marriage then speaks volumes to the world around you. Successful marriages also, what they do is they observe other marriages. This means, and the example here is, is um, Peter's drawing our attention to Sarah, so there's, there's an example that is there. I think for any of you, if you're young in your marriage, if you're going to get married, look at other examples of godly people. See how they have raised their children and how they have weathered storms and, and find someone you can talk with and be accountable. Someone to give you direction in your marriage. Observe other marriages. Also, successful marriages look to Scripture, not to the world around. Find the blueprint in Scripture, not the blueprint of the rest of the world around. The rest of the world says, seek your own happiness, and if divorce is the easiest way out, then take that route. Spiritually speaking, successful marriages look to what God's Word has to say. And then our final point tied in with some of the others successful marriages ultimately and this is the converse of the previous statement is this successful marriages become a testimony the rest of the world looks on and they say wow look what happened this godly woman is able to bring her husband and he starts changing as well and they stand back and they say i don't understand what's going on why is this happening successful marriages become a testimony the rest of the world. Let me pray for you as we close right now. God, right now I think about marriages and I pray for marriages. I think of the many people who are here this morning and God, I don't know what's going on in their marriage and I don't know how close they are to you or how far they are for you. God, I don't know, but you know. And I pray right now that we would have strong marriages in our church. God, I think about um, the potential of people in our church who might be unequally yoked. Maybe they have a husband or a wife who has to be drug out to church or maybe they're not interested at all. But God, I pray that you would work in those situations. I pray that the women of our congregation would be humble and seeking to serve you first and foremost. God, I pray that their husbands might be one to you even without a nagging word involved. God, I pray that actions would speak very, very loudly. God, I also pray for the men of our church who might have a spouse who's uninterested in spiritual things. God, I pray that we as men might step up and be the example that we need to be. I pray that we would care for our wives so desperately that we would just seek to draw them close to you. God, I pray that all of us would be blessed from being here this morning. I pray that we would leave here challenged, encouraged, and excited about your word and excited about what you can do in our lives and through our lives. And so God, I do pray all of these things in Jesus' name.
Amen.